All right, Living Way, Lionel Creek, where there's lions, snakes, and bears. We've got Xavier, Amina, and we're rolling here on a mini series, The Bear Necessities, right? You got bears up in Lionel Creek. Uh, and the Bible says to do what? Bear one another's burdens. Here, I'll take this guy here. All right. And that Bear Necessities, it reminds me of my youth. Uh, one of the first LP records that I owned was the uh, Jungle Book soundtrack. And whoever was doing the voiceover for Baloo sang a song called The Bare Necessities. And here are some of the lyrics. I'm not going to attempt to sing it. Uh, look for the bare necessities, the simple bare necessities. Forget about your worries and your strife. I mean, the bare necessities, God's created recipes that brings the bare necessities of life. So I did a little editing there. I don't, I'm not into the mother nature thing. So it's God's created recipes. Bear fruit, right? <laughs> that awesome sticker by that ODG apparel or whatever. Here, I better give this guy back to you. I'll see you guys in a little bit. Okay. Uh, yeah, that cool sticker, bear fruit. <laughs> I wanna get that shirt from ODG apparel or something maybe, but. Uh, we're going to talk about bears for reals, and we're going to get some gleaning from uh, the natural world. Bears, they have certain characteristics, right? So when you think of a bear, <laughs> they have a lot of strength, right? If you need a strong animal, uh, you can look to the bear. Also, they possess a high level of intelligence. And what are they known for, right? Bears do what in the winter? They hibernate. <laughs> so we're going to talk a little bit about those three characteristics of a bear and how we could you know, maybe glean some things uh, from those traits that they have. So strength. Bears are very strong and they are very powerful animals. Uh, they've been known to bend open car doors and rip windshields off to get at food in cars. If you've ever been to Yosemite, there's warnings everywhere, right? Don't leave food in your car and you have to put those, uh, open up those lockers and keep your food in there, right? Because the bears will just rip a car door off like a tin can. They're very strong. And bears routinely roll over huge rocks and logs trying to get to food and do various things. Um, let's see. Anyone out there think that bears are afraid of anything? Like, no, they're, they're not afraid. If you roll up on a bear, are they afraid of you? No, they can handle their business, right? So I don't think bears are afraid of much. So to, in a figurative sense, or for a person to, you know, metaphorically have the strength of a bear would be a good thing, especially in the Christian walk. It could bring some peace of mind, right? If you have that strength, especially if it's uh, controlled by the Holy Spirit. Now we are feeble folks. So we're talking about humans now. That's a reference to the Coney, which we will talk about later. We're gonna travel to Israel, right? In our mind and talk about that rock Hyrax. That's a little later. But God, so we're feeble folk though, like the Coney, but God gives us strength to live our lives without fear. God gives us the strength. We are weak, but he is strong. Isaiah 41.10 says this, Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. So that's the word of the Lord from the Bible. Uh, some phrases here. I will strengthen you, God says. That means to surround or protect or to aid. God says, he will uphold us. He says, I will uphold you. That is to sustain or to help or to follow close, right? I don't know if this is a real hotline, but you think I need help, right? <laughs> you need help in life and you just dial 1-800-NEED-GOD, right? <laughs> just cry out, call out to God because in life we face great and terrible adversaries, right? And adverse circumstances and things like that. Uh, out there, if you're watching, you can just kind of fill in the blank, right? You could say, hey, I'm experiencing this trial right now, filling in that blank. Uh, and maybe you are suffering a great trial right now. Well, the Bible has this encouragement for you from Romans chapter 8, verse 31. Paul says, what shall we say in response to these things, these tribulations? If God is for us, who or what circumstance can be against us, right? God's got your back. We talked about that in a previous lesson. Now here's an outline to consider. 
I got it from David Guzik. I love David Guzik. Jeremy, you love David Guzik? I love him. Yeah, <laughs> David Guzik. In all my sermons. <laughs> Enduring Word, and he's got an outline here from Ephesians 6.10. Uh, and that a phrase from Ephesians 6.10 is, Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. So in those dark trials, going through the outline now, you can look to the bright side of the light of all that God has done for you. You can reflect on life in light of the glorious standing you have as a child of God. You can reflect on life in light of his great plan of the ages that God has made you a part of, in light of the plan for Christian maturity and growth that he gives to you, in light of the conduct God calls every believer to live, you can reflect on life in the light of the filling of the Holy Spirit and our walk in the Spirit, implementing the gifts of the Spirit within the church and in your family and things. Certainly, though, in light of all this, there is a battle to fight in the Christian life. Since God is for us, who can be against us is another way to look at that passage from Romans 8 that we just went through shortly ago. Consider this. Physical strength without intelligence could be brutal, right? Think about that for a minute. We need strong minds too, clear minds, rational minds, in accordance with what the Bible teaches. Romans 12, 2 says, Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. 2 Corinthians 10, 5 says this, we destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. So that's just some perspective from the Bible on the importance of renewing the mind, having a clear mind, having a, a biblically motivated modus of thinking in what we do. If we're applying God's strength, that's a powerful combination there. So right thinking is very important. Thoughts result in behaviors, and behaviors develop into habits. So if you have bad habits, seek to prayerfully stop them by the power of the Holy Spirit and replace them with new habits, right? Sometimes that's easier said than done, but it's doable, right? The Bible promises that. <laughs> we have not been given a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound, a sound mind. And we will get to that passage a little later. If you have negative emotions, prayerfully ask the Holy Spirit to remove them and replace them with new emotions and or attitudes that are good, right? So just putting off that old way of thinking and embracing the new biblical way of thinking by the power of the Holy Spirit. Bear that power, strength and the strength of mind. Having all that going can bring you some very serious levels of peace of mind that are very important to have in life. And again, as promised, 2 Timothy 1, 7, for God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power and love and self-control. Or again, a sound mind, as another translation has it. So let's talk about hibernation, right? There's a bad form of hibernation. You say, hey, where's Fred, right? <laughs> or whatever friend comes to mind, and you go, oh, he's hibernating, you know, and it could be in the basement. Uh, playing video games 23 hours out of the day or something like that. Well, that's not a good form of caving out, really. I mean, you know, video games or entertainment in moderation is fine, right? But yeah, somebody's off the scene in a bad way. Well, you don't want to be like that. But bears do hibernate. They actually do something that's called torpor. It's a long form of sleep. They can sleep for as many as 100 days in a row without uh, having any food or anything like that. Uh, they rest for a season in that sort of hibernative state, as people refer to it as, to avoid harsh conditions, right? They do it during what season? They do it during the winter. They go cave out. And God designed them that way, right? Now, humans are different. We don't sleep for 100 days. Uh, but the principle here can be gleaned from Psalm 127, verse 2, B, for he gives to his beloved sleep. So God gives to those he loves cer certain levels of rest, right? Who out there doesn't feel like they've had enough rest lately, right? Yeah, Jeremy's raising his hand back there. <laughs> uh, yeah, it can be that way, right? We get, especially in the West, in the United States, 
Ministry is a series of checklists, right? I had a good drop-in visitor the other day, and he's a beloved friend. And I, my checklist is right there. He dropped by my office. But I knew. <laughs> Turn that thing over and give that time to my beloved friend and have that fellowship. We can get to the checklist later, and it's important to do uh, that kind of stuff. Now, that's not on my own accord. God's like, hey, dummy, this is your friend. That piece of paper with the stuff to do is less important. So just keeping that perspective in mind, fellowship, proper rest, certain levels of healthy uh, doses of entertainment and things, uh, God gives his beloved sleep and release and re relaxation and rest. Philippians 4, 6 and 7 says this, Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. Verse 7, And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Jesus himself said this in Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28. He said, Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. So strength, intelligence, and wise rest, laying low at opportune times. Now, one of my favorite things to talk about is often referenced by commentators or Bible teachers as being serpent wisdom. Well, that sounds a little counterintuitive because we think of serpents having certain characteristics. Well, that's brought out of Matthew chapter 10, verse 16. And uh, I'll say this, right? I'm the pastor of Living Way Lytle Creek. And one of my elders, John Mills, actually skinned a rattlesnake after church. And it drew a bit of a crowd. I wasn't there. I heard the report after the fact. But yeah, that's what you can get up at Lytle Creek Church, Living Way Lytle Creek. You might see a rattlesnake getting skinned and be part of that crowd there. <laughs> Nevertheless, in sending out the 12, Jesus said to them, Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves, be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves, Matthew 10, 16, from the King James Version. The NIV says, shrewd as snakes and innocent as doves, a different rendering. So what does it mean to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves? In using these similes, Jesus invokes the common proverbial view of serpents and doves. The serpent was subtle or crafty or shrewd, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1. Now, this is from S. Michael Houdman's research, by the way. The dove, on the other hand, was thought of as innocent and harmless. Doves were listed among the clean animals and were used for sacrifices. You can reference Leviticus 14.22 for that. To this very day, doves are used as symbols of peace, and snakes are thought of as sneaky, right? So we're getting into that simile. When Jesus told the twelve to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves, he laid down a general principle about the technique of kingdom work. Key point, tune in. As we take the gospel to a hostile world, we must be wise, avoiding the snares set for us, and we must also be innocent, serving the Lord blamelessly. That is, Jesus was not suggesting that we stoop to deception, God forbid, but that we, we should model some of the serpent's famous shrewdness in a positive way. So that's the principle there. If you hear me or any other uh, teacher or preacher reference serpent wisdom, that's part of it in application there. Here's the summarization of the matter. Wisdom does not equal dishonesty, and innocence does not equal gullibility. I will repeat that. The principle here from serpent wisdom. Wisdom does not equal dishonesty, and innocence does not equal gullibility. So to be a harmless dove in what you're doing doesn't mean that people are to take advantage of you, right? You balance it out. Now, I like this. I call this maybe an alternate interpretation of this principle. Perhaps it's more based on what we see from snakes themselves. I want to use rattlesnakes as an example because during the summer, the heat brings out rattlesnakes up in the Lytle Creek area. Now, I'll just ask you a question. Do snakes go looking for a fight with humans or bears or any other entity outside of themselves? Do they go looking for a fight? The answer is no, they don't, right? <laughs> but there's altercations, right? People suffer from snake bite every year. Why or how so? 
the snake gets surprised. They don't quite hear the person coming, walking down the trail. They get sort of rolled up upon, uh, unbeknownst to them previously, and then they turn around and in defending themselves, they strike and they bite the person. So in the best case scenario, the snake will hear the person on the trail, down the trail, and they don't wait in ambush. The snake will go sort of sneak off and slither off and then coil up somewhere else far away or a safe distance away from any interaction with an entity that they don't want to be interacting with, right? So that, I think that's a form of serpent wisdom as well. If there's a situation in life, in your family, in your church, in your workplace, that you can tell is going to be a contentious hotbed of argumentation or something, right? The internet, <laughs> you know, when your flesh is telling you to make that comment, but the spirit says, no, just let things slide. That's serpent wisdom. In a sense, you have just sort of snuck off. You've avoided that situation and you've gone to a place of rest rather than entering into <clears throat> an altercation or some type of tur turbulent, uh, <laughs> contentious argument and things like that. To be wise as a serpent with discernment and prudence, knowing when to avoid certain situations, to sort of slink out of unnecessary social squabbles and so forth, thus being safely out of the fray. So that's some food for thought, right? So we're talking about the bare essential, right? A little bit of hibernation, right? Laying low. Go hibernate to avoid an avoidably rough situation. Laying low sometimes, get some rest. Don't be contentious. Regain the strength that comes from the Lord. Go power up, right? Just go chill out for a little while. Get some time off. I hit a wall in my office yesterday, figuratively speaking, right? I was doing a bunch of work, uh, getting some syllabi and college courses set up because I direct uh, Living Way College in Fontana for Pastor Dave Zamora as the president of that institution. And I just had hit a wall. I, I like, couldn't do anything, but I knew from life experience that if I got out of the office and ran an errand and did something for half an hour, I could come back. And sure enough, that's what I did. And I came back to the office and I was able to crank out these notes for this presentation today. So that's just kind of how things go. You get a little bit of rest, power up. My understanding is that Albert Einstein would take a 10 minute rest every hour. And that's how he powered through figuring out all those equations and getting them up on the board and things like that. So some food for thought, get a little bit of rest throughout your day and it can go a long way. So here's a question. What is worse to meet than a bear, <laughs> right? So we're going to head towards the close here of our bear necessities, right? What is worse to meet than a bear? So referencing now Proverbs 17, 12, let a man meet a she bear robbed of her cubs rather than a fool in his folly. Commentator Urt supposes that this proverb arose from the riddle, what is worse than to meet a bear? The answer there is in the text itself from Proverbs 17, 12, essentially to come across a person totally given over to sin, to come across a person or interact with a person or encounter a person who is a fool given over to their folly. Word to the wise, let us watch over our own passions as to leave them unchecked would mean to be rendering harm to others and causing a peck of trouble wherever you go. And watch out too, when you see a fool in their folly, whew, go slink off, coil up, hibernate, get some rest, hang out, let that situation pass, and there you go. So those are some of the bare necessities we've covered. I wanna get back to that Jungle Book lyric, take it for what it's worth. Imagine Baloo singing this, right? The Bare necessities, I promised I wouldn't do that, but there you go. No extra charge, Jungle Book. Baloo continues, and don't spend your time looking around for something you want that can't be found. When you find out you can live without it and go along not thinking about it, I'll tell you something true, the bare necessities of life will come to you. So there you go, uh, the prophet of the day, Baloo from Jungle Book. Bottom line, keep it simple, be strong, wise, and rested up. Those are some bare necessities for the Christian life. Bear fruit, 
And I will end with this, John 15, 8. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. End of message. God bless you guys. Oh, my God.